This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. You're sitting impatiently in your seat, filled so to the brim with excitement and anticipation. The crowd around you is murmuring, shuffling their feet, fancy dress and playbills. You overhear conversations about a piece in The New Yorker, someone's son Brian having gotten into simply the best preschool. A woman of about 25 is excitedly explaining the history of the trombone to her moppy-haired boyfriend who is restraining laughter as she repeats in earnest over and over again the word sack butt. The conductor appears, everyone hushes, the blood drains from moppy boyfriend's face, and the playbills go away. The orchestra tunes. This is what we're going to talk about today. Actually, not really about this. <coughs> but about this. And, I mean, I guess, strictly speaking, not even that. Really, we're going to be talking about this. The frequency of the note which the orchestra uses to tune. A note otherwise known as concert pitch, but okay. Well, we are already a couple complicated words and concepts ahead of ourselves. Let's step back for a sec and return to the concert hall. Okay, crowd, check. Conductor, check. Then, the oboe. Usually, not always, but usually, the orchestra tunes to the oboe. You know the oboe. It's the long, skinny one with a flared bell on one end. On the other end, a skinny reed sticking out. It's covered in machinery called keys or keyworks that its player manipulates to expose or cover holes bored into its side. Its sound is a little nasal, but clear. You might remember it as the instrument played by the weird kid in high school. No offense, former or current oboe players. Some of y'all are great friends, but... Admit it, you were, or are, the weird ones. So anyway, the oboe plays a note, a very specific note, which we're going to talk lots about in a few minutes, and then all the other musicians tune, adjust, run scales from, or do whatever else in response that they feel is necessary to ensure that the sonic playing field is even. The oboe says, hey, everyone, this is our anchor point. You got it? And the rest of the instruments say, yep. We're in agreement. Let's do this. Okay, so, but you might have started wondering, if you're not completely enraptured by Swan Lake, why the oboe? Like, You've probably heard of an oboe, maybe you can picture one, but the oboe isn't a violin or piano or cello or flute or one of a dozen other instruments that seems more, I don't know, common or something. Why doesn't the orchestra tune to one of those things? The answer, as it turns out, is pretty easy. 
<laughs> just kidding. No, it's not. One part of the answer is actually part of most answers to most questions about how and why orchestral or chamber music is performed the way it is, because that's just how it's been done. For as long as things have needed to be tuned to each other, we've been tuning things to the oboe. It was one of, if not the, first instrument to join string ensembles in early Western chamber music, and its sound is clear and distinct. It can be heard easily amongst the wash of all the other instruments, unlike, say, a violin or piano, which have a much more mellow tone or which can be quiet while playing certain pitches. It has a timbre, meaning quality of sound that just sticks out. Oh, also, as it turns out, and this is pretty important, you don't tune an oboe. Pretty much every other instrument is, in some meaningful sense, tunable, or at least capable of going out of tune. Strings, slides, reeds, membranes, even instrument bodies, all flexible in some way that is musically significant. An oboe, not so much. The joke I've always heard is that you don't tune an oboe, you tune its player. The shape of an oboist's mouth can adjust its pitch, and the reed can too, but to quote, improving intonation in band and orchestra performance, in reference to the oboe, quote, tuning mechanism, none. It is not advisable to adjust the overall pitch of the instrument. So the oboe, assuming its player is skilled, is consistent, unless we're playing in a room at the relative humidity of 90% or you've recently decided to go to town on your oboe with a drill press or orbital sander, we can bet the notes coming out of it today are the same as the ones that came out of it yesterday, or the day before that, and the day before that. To be fair, though, in the absence of an oboe, the orchestra might tune to a clarinet, in the presence of a piano or harpsichord, the orchestra might tune to those, but it's also not uncommon for the pianist or harpsichordist to play their concert note, which the oboe player then repeats, and then the rest of the orchestra tunes. A little bit of practicality, a little bit of tradition. I'm not going to lie, I really like it. This weird kind of, I don't know, respect? For the oboe, as the tuning clarion, the instrument from which everyone gets their concert pitch. But okay, here we are. Concert pitch. The note the oboe, or clarinet, or piano, or if the orchestra is newfangled, the digital tuner, plays. How did anyone decide that pitch? We tune to that one. There's nothing inherent about that note which makes it, by some clear and objective reason, the pitch most suited for tuning the orchestra. What's the deal? Why that one? And what pitch is it anyway? Well, okay, I can tell you, but it's going to take a while. So the pitch that the oboe plays and that the rest of the orchestra tunes to, by name, is A. For anyone who doesn't have a lick of music theory background, if you're starting to get the cold sweats, I understand. Don't worry, we're going to make this super easy, but there are a few things we got to cover. If you start to have flashbacks to your middle school music theory lessons and you need to pause the podcast for a second to catch your breath or dab your forehead, I totally get it. That's fine. I'll be here waiting when you're ready to move on, but rest assured, it's not going to get too crazy. And I guess for anyone who does have a music theory background, just, um, I don't know, run through the modes in your head for the next couple minutes while I explain stuff you already know. It is a bit of a digression, so I'll put on some digression music. So, concert pitch is always an A. In Western music, we have 12 note names that repeat over and over again. Those note names, or pitch classes, as they are sometimes called, go from A through G. On a piano keyboard, those are the white keys. There are other notes, called sharps and flats, in between most of those letters. 
on a piano keyboard, those are the black keys. So for instance, we have A, and then A sharp, then B, then C, because there's no note between B and C, C sharp, then D, D sharp, E, F, because like B and C, there's no note between E and F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and then back to A. In modern music, each sharp is also a flat, so A sharp is B flat, C sharp is D flat. They are literally the same note, the same sound, just with a different name. You don't even really need to know that for right now. I just thought it would be fun to explain, and hey, now you're smarter. Pitches are organized into octaves. The word octave has two meanings. It's an interval, meaning a number of notes distance, specifically 12 notes, including white and black keys, if we're sticking with a piano keyboard as our visualization, between two pitches, from one A to the next A in that repeating pattern we just talked about, for instance. That is an interval of one octave. But octaves are also used to describe where exactly a note is in the range of notes from very low to very high. In what's called scientific notation, a pitch class, like A or D sharp or G flat, is paired with its octave number to indicate a specific note. Very low notes have a low octave number, maybe even a negative one, and very high notes have a high octave number. So, for instance, in scientific notation, G3 is the note G in the third octave, this note. D flat 5 is this note. C4 is what's called middle C, right in the middle of the piano keyboard. See, that wasn't too bad. You did great. Okay, music theory lesson over. The note which the orchestra tunes to is A4. The orchestra tunes to this note because every stringed instrument has an open A string. Open meaning a string which, when not stopped or held down by a finger, produces an A. There's also some speculation, apparently, about A being the beginning of the cycle of pitch classes, at least alphabetically, and so maybe it was seen as a logical starting note to use as concert pitch. I've also seen some folks claim it was just a thing some guy decided on a whim and we've just been stuck with it ever since. I'm pretty sold on the explanation that since it's best and easiest to tune an open string, and all the stringed instruments, of which there are many in an orchestra, have an open A string, tuning your A string first and then the rest of your instrument to that now in tune string just makes the most sense. A4 doubly so because it's in a comfortable register for a great many instruments, right in the middle of the range of notes produced by the ensemble. Clear, comfortable, convenient, A4. But don't get too comfortable. Conveniently, since I've got about half a podcast to get through, the reasoning behind this reason isn't actually that clear. It might make sense how we decided to tune to A4, but how did we decide what A4 is tuned to? I know, musical turtles all the way down. What I'm asking is this, how do we know my A4 is always the same as your A4? When I play A4 here in New York, is it the same A4 that's being played in Los Angeles or London, St. Petersburg? Is A4 always the same A4, no matter where that A4 is being played? The simple answer is that it's not. A4s the world over aren't the same, even, and in some cases especially, if they're being used to tune an orchestra. An A4 here and an A4 there can both be A4s in name, but not, at least not exactly, A4s in sound. What? I'm sure you just exclaimed loudly about the minutia of tuning standards in Western orchestral music, but I am for real. 
not Joshin at all. It works like this. In addition to describing musical notes by their pitch, A4, C sharp 2, whatever, we can also measure their frequency in cycles per second, or hertz. Essentially, the lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. It's important to note, though, that pitch and frequency are two different things. For example, the most common frequency for A4 is 440 hertz. 440 hertz played as a sine wave sounds like this. A guitar playing A4 tuned to 440 hertz sounds like this. For fun, here's both together. If, however, the guitar's A4 were tuned to 450 hertz, which sounds like this, it would still, in some sense, be playing A4, even though its frequency is 10 hertz higher. If the rest of the strings on the guitar are tuned from A4 at 450 hertz, it sounds perfectly fine and musically correct. See? We start to get into trouble, though, if this guitar wants to play with other instruments whose A4s are tuned to something else. So, to keep this mess from happening, we, meaning a good portion of the Western musical world, have agreed to use A4 tuned to 440 hertz, or A440 as it's called, as a pitch standard. That means that it's understood in bands and orchestras and concert halls by musicians, composers, conductors, instrument and gear makers all over the place that A4's frequency should be 440 hertz. If you play in a band and use an electronic tuner, its internal standard is almost certainly A440. If you use a tuning fork, even if it's not an A4 tuning fork specifically, its pitch is most likely derived from the A440 pitch standard. Most pop music on the radio, A440. The International Standards Organization, or ISO, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, and responsible for maintaining all kinds of crazy standards, like official abbreviations for every country, and operational fundamentals and vocabulary for quality management systems in manufacturing processes, and thousands of other crazy things, they even maintain a standard, 161975 to be specific, which, quote, specifies the frequency for the note A in the treble stave and shall be 440 hertz. Tuning and retuning shall be affected by instruments producing it within an accuracy of 0.5 hertz. End quote. A standardized pitch. A literal pitch standard. Now, it took us a while to get to this point. In the podcast, yes, but also like in history. Which we're going to talk about in a sec, but before we do, this next section is heavily indebted to the work of Bruce Haynes and his book, A History of Performing a Pitch, The Story of A. It is a 600-page tome about the history of pitch standards in Europe, and man, if this stuff interests you, I cannot recommend it highly enough. So... There wasn't always a pitch standard, and before there was, what a mess. I mean, at first it was okay. For one thing, in early Western musical history, you had church music and secular music. Church music was played by organs, with maybe a choir, but as long as the organ wasn't on some crazy high or stupid low tuning, well, human voices are pretty versatile and can just adjust. Secular music was mostly played in small, local groups using instruments made and tuned according to regional standards. In certain places, secular instruments for a really long time weren't even allowed in church. And so there was no threat of a violin built and tuned on one standard playing music next to an organ built to another standard. 
It was only once musicians and popular musical works began to travel significant distances, and once secular instruments, woodwinds, strings, brass, began to collide with religious music, that the instrumentalists of yore realized, hey, wait, we got a problem here. As early as the 17th century, many regions in Europe had their own pitch standards. They ranged anywhere from A390 to A475-ish. And over the next couple hundred years, as trade routes changed and grew, as the import and export of goods and people and culture became more popular and, I guess, uh, possible, those many and wide-ranging standards would collide. There was some luck in that many pitch standards were different in ways that were musically coherent, meaning the frequency of A4 in one part of Germany might be the frequency of B4, only two notes higher, in one part of Italy. And so, to accurately play the music and or instruments of one region in another, it was only a matter of shifting all the notes in some direction, a process called transposition, no retuning necessary. However, in situations where the transposition would have been too large or not musically coherent, things were less fun. Human voices can shift, sure, but depending upon the amount of shift, it could become uncomfortable. Many instruments can be retuned, but lots of them are made with specific tunings in mind. Raising or lowering the pitch can be dangerous or just make a beautiful, sonorous thing sound like crap. Many other instruments are just what they are. You want a totally different tuning? Better get a totally different bassoon. Or, I mean, what if a composer from France likes A392 and nothing else, but an ensemble in Germany who plays at A464 wants to play their work? For these reasons, and tons more, it became necessary, or maybe not necessary, but definitely convenient, for the Western musical establishment to agree on a pitch standard. Haynes puts A440's first stirrings as a widely adopted standard at around 1830 or 1840. Add some wars, actual government decrees on the matter, lots of France being difficult, and of course, a fair share of politics, musical and actual, and we get to where we are today. You, me, symphony orchestra, oboe, A440. Though, this does raise an interesting, and depending upon who you ask, important question. If you're at a concert to hear the work of one J.S. Bach, and it's a piece written for A432, but it is being played in A440, are you really hearing what Bach wrote? The difference might seem minor numerically, but the sonic difference can be discernible, if not staggering. There's this change of weight and attitude. Sure, the pitches all drop a little bit, but... Something more happens, something sonic, but also something physical, something obviously hard to explain with words or capture in this here podcast at this exact moment, so you might just have to take my word for it. Assuming you do, suddenly A440, our pitch standard, which has made so many other things easier and clearer, is working against us. As Haynes puts it in the preface to his book, if we are interested in original sonorities, if we want our instruments to act and feel as they did when they first were played, and our voices to function as they did for the composers who conceived their parts, it seems we have no choice but to renounce the luxury of a single, hard-earned pitch standard. In a weird way, then, the history and development of the pitch standard is also 
kind of the history and development of sonic standards, and in some perhaps overblown sense, cultural standards. Insofar as a region's pitch standard and the sound of an ensemble that adheres to it is reflective of the values, traditions, or ideas of that region, which I honestly don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, the spread of A440 is also the spread of some cohesive idea of musical culture. The history of the pitch standard is the history of the Western world shrinking to a degree that people and ideas could travel across it. It's the history of instrument construction and the related science, engineering, and labor. These days, especially throughout parts of Europe, A4 will commonly be tuned to somewhere between 440 and 444 hertz. The last I heard, totally anecdotally, A442 was becoming rather popular. Only 2 hertz higher than the standard. Just so you know, on the micro level, what that sounds like, here are two sign tones, 440 and 442 hertz, respectively, one right after the other. To most people, nearly indistinguishable. However, on the scale of an entire set of instruments built and played and written for with such precision, an apparently meaningful difference, a brighter sound, I've heard, more lively, maybe more strained, but also a little more alive. And relatedly, I think, a bit of a fuck you to the more standard standard. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram and Twitter at ReasonablySND. You can find me in most places at Mike Rugnetta.